thank God for the reading of his precious word. Rise of the Great Light, part two, is the title of our message. We begin this chapter with the children of Israel in a in a state of uh, great distress and in their distress the Lord provided for them uh, the prophecy of the coming of Christ the Saviour the deliverer, the one who can change the weary heart and give it life again, the one who can turn things around. For Isaiah will bring to the dismal heart of God's people, great hope. And if we have Christ in our hearts, if we have Christ in our life, it is all we need for life. And we thank the Lord that the prophecy of God, the love of God, reaching out to straying, straight and lost sinners has never been abated since the day that he created this earth. He knew well. He saw what will be the outcome of his creation. And by his permissive will, he allow all these things to happen. And man has gone through a lot. And we say the six, seven thousand years of human history, what for? Why God allow all the misery to take place, all the sadness, all the pain? Well, it is to let us know, isn't it, that we are in trouble, we are in need, and that by our wisdom we haven't had a solution. And so God had to send his prophet to give the good news. And in the fullness of time, God will have to send his son. When our Lord Jesus began his ministry, after his temptation in the wilderness, it was recorded the fulfillment of Isaiah 9 verse 2. The people that walked in the darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the shadow, land of the shadow of death, upon them has the light shined. Some 700 years after Isaiah gave the prophecy, Matthew recorded its fulfillment. In Matthew 4, verses 17, 12 to 17. Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee. Persecution was coming. Things were changing. The scene was uh, becoming hostile. And leaving Nazareth, that's where he lived, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which was upon the sea coast, it's the Sea of Galilee, in the borders of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness saw great light. And to them 
which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. How can light come and shine through the darkness? Well, the darkened human heart as a result of sin can only be dispelled, as it were, when men would turn from their sins and turn to Christ. So Jesus says, repent. You need a change of heart. Repent of your old ways, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus called his kingdom the kingdom of heaven. It's not the kingdom of earth. Right? Because this earth is going to be destroyed. This earth is going to be burned up. And he's going to create new heavens and new earth. So he says, the kingdom of heaven in that he came from heaven and that in the first part of his plan uh, we will find ourselves uh, the reckoning uh, as we think that if we have not a part in the kingdom of heaven then we are a part of the realm of hell whereby Satan and his minions and all who have not the light would be consigned for everlasting judgment. So he was that great light that came and Isaiah predicted the incarnation, that God would come in human flesh. This is the greatest revelation that God has for His people. This is the way by which man can be saved. The incarnation. God coming in human flesh. So John, the apostle, revealed this truth when he wrote in First. In John 1, verse 1 to 5, he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the English language, we say it's the Word. It's the Word. In the Greek, it's the Logos. In the Greek, the word Logos has a greater, deeper meaning. In the Chinese Bible, we call it the Tao. And if you talk to a Chinese man, he would understand what is the Tao. It encompasses the whole of life, the death of life, everything, the Tao. and includes heaven. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God, was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. That was the Word. And the Word would become flesh. And the Lord wants us to see concerning the mystery of the Incarnation. For this Word was so powerful that by Him came the existence of the created world. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. You know, this you need illumination to understand. But if you are illuminated, then I think that settles it forever, isn't it? If you have understood, then... The God of this world has blinded us. But when God has opened our eyes, how wonderful is that light that came into our heart. Isn't it so? Well, I personally came to understand by this verse. 
Okay. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him. Wow! Can we understand this truth? All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. He was exclusively the Creator. And not only did He make things, but He gives life to the things that He made. In Him was life. The Spirit. Ah, how profound are these words. Life, not just physical life, but eternal life, spiritual life. It gives you satisfaction in life. It gives you fullness of life. It gives you life. And life encompasses all the good things that life gives and life brings, isn't it? The richness of the spiritual life, the joy that comes with that life. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. In other words, He's the one that gave the life, not just the physical life. Well, we are satisfied with just physical life. But He's saying to us, don't be satisfied with that. That physical life is very limited. Three score years and ten, and after that, by way of strength, four score. Right? <laughs> Some of us are <laughs> above four score, right? Uh, so, wow. So the Lord says to us here, The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. What a sad thing that God came to impart life upon us and we cannot see that light. The forerunner of Christ, John the Baptizer, had suffered sore persecution. He was cast into prison for proclaiming Christ. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness. And the word witness uh, is the word martyr. Okay. The word witness is the word that we derive our English word martyr. Why? Because the ultimate of a witness is that we would stand for the truth, stand for the Lord with our very life. And so, here, he came to bear witness of the, of the light. So much so that he did not recant when he was in prison. Right? He was very clear when he spoke to Herod, denouncing sin, until his head was taken off. What a tragic end, if you put it in our own uh, unenlightened uh, heart. But for John, his life was lived to its fullest. And it was in the fullness of his strength that he was brought to heaven. You see the difference there? The fullness of his strength he was brought to heaven just as it was for Stephen, the first martyr of the church. After Pentecost, he was the first to be brought to heaven. They stoned him. You know, as a stone fell upon him, 
right? He saw Christ standing in heaven, welcoming him. So he understood the eternal things. And the Lord wants us to see. The trouble with Israel is that they could not see, not only did they not see, but they were lost as the people of God. What a sad state. But Isaiah gave the prophecy so that none would be without hope. None would be without help. But all would be given the truth. He was not that light, but he bare witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. You see the contradiction there? What a tragedy. The Father, He was called the Everlasting Father, the one who gave life to each one. But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of men, but of God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The access of God's favour, the access to God's favour is through Christ. And through Him, we have fullness of God's favour, fullness of life. And in Him, we are led rightly. Right? Later on, you see that He's called the, the Counselor. Why? Because He knows the truth. You see? He's the one that can guide us rightly, correctly. The other side is that, you know, the one who proclaimed falsehood. Oh, if you are led by the by the liar, then it is a very slippery slope downhill all the way to the lake of fire, isn't it? The true light was the great light that Isaiah predicted would come the saviour of the world. The presence of God with his people find his culmination in God coming to dwell with men in human flesh. The Apostle Paul testified that he was unworthy, an unworthy candidate for salvation, having persecuted the church and having blasphemed Christ. Christ came that he might have given everlasting life to have as many as received Him. Wow, everlasting life. Can we imagine that? I think we cannot really understand this. And the Christian haven't really understood this. Because if you have understood this, then your life will be different, you know. Your life will be totally different. You have everlasting life. Would you be cumbered by this bodily war, this earthly war? You will not be because God has given you everlasting life. So Paul was so grateful. He says, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long-suffering 
for a pattern to them that should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Jesus Christ should show all long suffering. Why did God use that term? Why did Paul use that term? Because he knew who he was before his conversion. He knew how hard it is, how much he was against Christ. He was a great blasphemer. And how the Lord had to suffer greatly in the sense that his people were greatly persecuted even to death. Right? You know, Paul is a very special man. He has two PhDs. PhD in law. He was called the Pharisee of the Pharisees. Right? Amongst the Pharisees, he was the top of the Pharisees. Okay. Ah. And among the, the, the religious people there, well, he was the one with was trained by Gamaliel, and he was the one who was greatly trusted even by the high priest. That's why he was given the, the letter you know, from the high priest to persecute, had given the authority. So he was no mean man. Okay. So to, to reach such a person, uh, he is the, the worst of the worst, you see. The most deluded of the deluded. He was so deluded. And for him to be turned around, wow. Jesus Christ was very long-suffering. That's what he wrote himself. <laughs> so, you know, I think Christ wants to form himself in us so that we can be a witness for him to the people around us easily. Christ was all long-suffering. If he was not all long-suffering, right, Paul wouldn't be saved in the sense that he gave time to work it all out until he saw the light. Sometimes God has to work it out, work it all out in our lives. Right? Just in the, the life of the prodigal son, God allowed him. He had to go. God has to allow him to go. For a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to, ever, to life everlasting. You see, he always emphasized this, life everlasting. That's the ultimate, isn't it? That's truly life. Not this, not really. Right? This life is a transient or transitory life. We are transiting into a better life. But we have a work as the light, as John was the little light, as a witness for God, you see. And this is the text that was written so as to encourage the hearts of the remnant of God's people. There's still a group who wants to follow the Lord. But they see all the decay around him, around them. And they get so discouraged by all the vicissitudes of the decay of a life around them. It's how sad it is. The children of Israel, the people who were given the oracles of God and yet they have fallen through. How to, how to lift them up 
Well, this is the ultimate prophecy. The coming of the Son of God. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name which shall be called Wonderful Counselor. This is what we endeavour to, to reach today. The vision of the prophet is that the long-expected Messiah is to be born, and he's going to be growing up amidst surrounding darkness in Israel. This child is born fully man, and yet the Son of God, fully God. Unto us, a child is born. It is an extraordinary child, E.J. Young well commented. A climatic sentence, he wrote. There is great rejoicing among God's people because God has broken the yoke of burden and oppression and the burden and oppression are removed because the weapons and garments of the warriors are destroyed. And the basic reason for this is that a child is born. So why, how, what is Isaiah contrasting? He's contrasting the mighty fall of Assyria, the coalition of, uh, of Assyria and the coalition of Syria and, on, and Ephraim, the northern ten tribes, that this child will bring deliverance to the people of God. And the form of the verb there, the perfect tense, emphasize a truth that will happen, a historical record of the birth. The deliverance will bring rejoicing to the people of God. It's not something vague, but something to be brought about by a birth in history upon this earth, at a definite time, at a definite place. The birth of this child is the gift of God. This is the greatest prophecy. He is a child. He is also a son. The birth of this child and this son, not just any male child, but a son, and this son is also vaccinated, as it were. For our text tells us, the government shall be upon his shoulder. He is the son of God, the son of David, a legitimate heir to David's throne. He is to bear the government with all its responsibilities and he is to bear the government upon David's throne. Isaiah 22, 22. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. So he shall open and none shall shut and he shall shut and none shall open. By this time, there were many sons of David after his death. The northern kingdom has broken off. They were about to be eaten up by the Assyrians. God has sent the Assyrians to judge his people for departing from him. And there's the little Judah that is left. And yet, there are few good kings and then many bad kings. And so... The throne, the, the authority of God seemed to have been usurped, but not so. For this child would bear the government upon his shoulder. So he's not only the son of David, but he is the son of God. And some too describe for us, the Lord said to me, Thou art my son, this day have I 
begotten thee. This is a very wonderful proclamation in Psalm 2 of the defeat of the Antichrist kingdom and the many Antichrist kingdom that arise over human history that God will break them in sunder that the power of darkness has no sway because God is still reigning upon earth and when we understand that it gives us great courage to live. It gives us great courage to proclaim. It great, gives us great understanding, heart to be able to stand as a light amidst gross darkness. And that has always been the situation in the world. In the sense, when Christ came, Israel was at its lowest. They have all departed from Him. And so the prophecy must give us hope that there is salvation, there is deliverance, there is help in Jesus Christ. And He is the self-existing Son of God before His incarnation. Hebrews 1 verse 2 says, God spoke finally through His Son. He spoke through the prophets, he spoke through dream, he spoke through vision, but finally he spoke to his son, his only begotten son. And Isaiah has developed this theme of hope. You remember in chapter 7, he gives us the prophecy of the virgin birth. He tells us about the Emmanuel that God is with us in the midst of darkness and he tells us about the, how evil is going to be defeated by the virgin birth, that Christ will be sinless. He will be the sinless Son of God to bear our sins. You see, we need to take time to know what we say, the signs of the cross. To study deeply into God's way. We can spend three years, four years to study this subject, that subject, but let us take time to study what God is doing. in human history, in human life. The emphasis here on the text is upon the eternal kingdom of God. Not so much this earthly kingdom where men under the curse of God since the fall will experience sin and inevitably death. There is little comfort if life is seen only from an earthly perspective which we as earthling tend to look at ourselves, isn't it? Right? We are so earthbound. We look at our problems as an earthlings and then we get all jittery. <laughs> isn't it so true? That's who we are. But God wants us to see beyond, you see. God wants us to see ourselves as eternal beings through Christ where the curse could be lifted or the curse is lifted at his first coming. No man still experiences death, but there is a lifting of the curse at the second coming with the giving of the resurrection bodies for all believers. That's why Paul says, with these words, comfort one another. That's what he speaks concerning the resurrection. Why? 
Because unless we have an eternal perspective, our earthbound understanding will bring us to great despair, you see. And so this child that is to be born is called Wonderful. Wonderful. Something extraordinary, something marvelous, something miraculous, because he's more than a man. He's God's highest miracle. He is the mystery of godliness explained, fulfilled. God coming in human flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, Preach unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Ah, God wants us to see the glory. And unless we see the glory, isn't it? Our life has not been transformed. Right? We, we mentioned about the word transform, transformation, right? The word transformation is the same word that is used to describe Christ's transfiguration. When he was changed bodily, when he came on earth, the glory that was due to him, the Shekinah glory was, as it were, set aside. But when he was in the mound with the three disciples, he showed his glory. Wow, they saw it. And the Lord wants us to see that glory. And then we'll say, it's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. God coming to fellowship with me is wonderful. We have that fellowship with God. Then our life is very full, very satisfied, you see. That was the fellowship that the Father had the Son, with the Son in the Godhead that God wants to impart to us. So why is it so wonderful that the Son is given? That we might be the partakers of His divine nature. Right? Jesus Christ is not only God, but He's, he's, he's not only man, but He's God, you see. To be partakers of the divine nature Peter explained right, that he may, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, right, that spiritual divine nature enables us to lift above the gravity of sin and decay and corruption. Right? Sin and decay and corruption is like gravity pulling us down we, by the Spirit's power, is able to overcome. You see. How wonderful it is to live that kind of a life, isn't it? If you have no overcoming, then of course we, are, we feel miserable. But God has, in Christ, given us that power to overcome, to live, to be partakers of the divine nature, to be able to advise others. So Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. J.C. Rao says, It's a wide description. It comprises multitudes in this weary world, all who feel a load on their heart, of which they would fain to get free, a load of sin, a load of sorrow, a load of anxiety, a load of remorse, or whoever they may be, whosoever their past lives, all such are invited to come to Christ. And what is the gracious offer? I will give you rest. You shall find rest in your soul. What cheering and comforting words. Unrest is the great characteristic of the world, isn't it? The world is always hurrying. 
The world is always vexed with failure, disappointment, stare us in the face on every side. Right? Our monetary system is about to collapse, falling its own, on its own weight. The genius of man devising his own destruction, purposely, But there is hope, isn't it? In the ark of the refuge for the weary. There is rest in Christ. A rest for the conscience, a rest for the heart. Rest built on pardon of all sin and rest flowing from peace with God. Burdens are lifted when we come to Christ. What a wonderful Saviour. I will close here. Uh, we will carry on the next part, the counsellor, uh, with the chorus. Uh, what a wonderful saviour. Uh, what a wonderful saviour. Uh, we shall sing it a cappella. What a wonderful saviour, Jesus Christ my Lord. What a wonderful Saviour, from sin He set me free. I will praise Him forever, faithful to death I'll be. What a wonderful Saviour, Jesus is to me. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank Thee for Thy Word. Thank Thee for showing us, indeed, Jesus Christ is wonderful because He has set us free from our sins and set us free from eternal death, O Lord, and He has freed us that we may praise Him forever. O Lord, help us, indeed, to be faithful, faithful to the death and faithful and grateful for all that we have received, the gift of eternal life. Thank thee, Lord, for thy mercy upon us. Indeed, that was that thy mercy is great and that thy mercy is new and is uh, every morning. O oh God, we thank thee. May thou strengthen thy people as we uh, lift uh, the, from the life that thou gives us moment by moment. Thank Thee for all that we have received. And what we would have yet to receive, O oh Lord, we thank Thee. Praise Thee for Thy own namesake. Hear our prayer through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.